This is the lecture for Yang Ming Han's Do We Love for Reasons. So the first topic is De Dicto and De Re. So this comes up on page 121. And he says, still, <clears throat> one might worry that rationalist resources are also needed because finding good De Dicto precedes love. Coming to love or care about some entity sometimes seems to begin with our appreciating their value or finding them good de dicto or worthy of love. So you actually don't really need to understand what uh, de dicto means in this context. He uses it a few times, but he, he always sort of uses synonyms also. Uh, so he sort of explains what he means down here. So you can read the article and it will make sense even if you don't understand uh what he means but uh just because he mentions it now is a good time to talk about it since it's an interesting distinction that we use for a lot of things in philosophy so it's worth talking about so de dicto and de re are latin phrases de dicto is sort of about what is said is the way we translate it and de re is about the thing itself and uh one of the easiest ways to illustrate kind of the main way we use de dicto versus de re is to imagine I say something like uh, like we're, we're in a room with a lot of people and I say, I want to marry the tallest person in the room. Now there's two things I might mean by that. One thing I might mean is, uh, look, I don't really care who I marry except that I want to marry a very tall person. So I'd like to marry whoever is tallest in this room. So uh, if we're looking around and we see somebody, oh, that person is uh, two meters tall, I want to marry them. But then they leave the room, and now the next tallest person is 1.9. Now I want to marry that person. So I just want to marry whoever fits uh, the label, the tallest person in the room at this moment. So that's one possibility. That would be unusual if I said that. More likely what I mean is, oh, I want to marry uh, X just some person, and they happen to be the tallest person in the room. So if they left the room, I wouldn't want to marry the tallest person in the room anymore. I'd still want to marry X, and now they're walking around somewhere else. So uh, I can use the label the tallest person in the room to refer to X because they happen to be the tallest person in the room, uh, but that's not why I want to marry them. I want to marry them for normal sorts of reasons. Uh, so somebody who says, I want to marry the tallest person in the room, if we understand them de dicto, to sort of be just talking about uh, the label, what they mean is the first sort of thing I said. Like, I don't care who it is. I don't care, like, who that label refers to. I just want to marry whoever the tallest person in the room is. So that's de dicto. They're sort of talking kind of like about the label, about uh, what is said. So what is said is the tallest person in the room. Like, the phrase is what matters to them. Versus the second probably more normal interpretation, uh, which is they're talking about some particular person. So they're talking about X, who happens to be the tallest person in the room. So that's one way of using the de dicto, de re distinction. Uh, we use it in a lot of cases for a lot of things. Uh, and in this particular case, it's coming up because we're talking about, uh, look, coming to love or care about some entity sometimes seems to begin with our appreciating their value or finding them good de dicto or worthy of love. So finding somebody good de dicto in this case means finding them worthy of love, like these are compatible phrases. And so if you just find somebody good de dicto, uh, it's not like you find them good like for some other reason. So it's not like I want to marry the tallest person in the room for some other reason, like I'm in love with them or whatever. No, uh, I want to marry the tallest person in the room because they fit that label. Or uh, I find somebody good, not because of some other reason, but because, look, they're just, they're like a good person. They're like worthy of love. They're like a lovable person, period. Not for some other quality, because in itself, they're lovable. Uh, so, and we get some examples, not some examples, but just explaining this in other ways below. So, for example... One normally comes to love someone through experience of him, experience in which one appreciates directly the value that one affirms in loving him. 
To love someone is to be in part aware and deeply convicted of his value. So it's just like, this person is just good. This person is lovable. This person is worthy of love, not in some other way, like not because they're very tall or not because they're good at sports or not because they're funny, but just because they're they're good, period. And so that's sort of why it's de dicto. It's just about the label worthy of love or good or something, as opposed to de re, which would be about some other property. So again, you don't need to understand what like de dicto means because again, he just explains it with a synonym. He says worthy of love, but it's worth talking about. Second, very small point, but he doesn't explain it, so it's worth mentioning. So uh, on the next page, uh, part of what rationalists would presumably take that to involve, and it doesn't matter what that is, but it's appreciating value. So part of what rationalists presumably would presumably take appreciating value to involve is believing or seeing it as good or valuable de dicto. Where this is meant to be abstractly or meant to be an abstractly or thinly representational state that doesn't involve any affect. So what is it to appreciate value? It's an abstractly or thinly representational state that doesn't involve any affect. So you know what? Actually, let's explain two things. So what is a representational state? <laughs> it's, it's kind of what it sounds like, but it's a it's a confusing label. So uh, when I see something and I sort of have an image of it in my head, we talk about me as like representing it to myself. And this happens when I see something or when I think about something, when I conceive of something. So for instance, when I think about uh, this water bottle, I sort of represent it to myself, and I represent it as having various properties. So in in my head, it's represented as being red and being full of water and being owned by me and stuff. So that's how I sort of represent it to myself. Uh, that may, I sort of made it sound like I'm picturing it visually or something, but that's not the point. So for instance, like it doesn't have to, we don't have to be representing physical qualities or anything. Uh, so, for instance, when you think about uh, your future, how do you represent it to yourself? Well, probably it's not like a visual thing. You're not like you, you can't picture the future as a like visual thing. But uh, maybe you represent it to yourself as scary or you represent it to yourself as exciting or maybe you don't represent it to yourself. Maybe you don't sort of think about uh, your future very often. And uh, just we represent all sorts of things in our head all the time. And what he's saying here is that people think of appreciating value as a representational state. So when I say I'm appreciating value, what I mean is I'm representing something to myself in my head. And what is that like? Well, he's not really telling us a lot, except he says it's a thinly representational state or an abstractly representational state. So there's not like a lot going on. So when you're appreciating value, it's like a thin or an abstract thing. It's not like uh, when you're representing, like let's say you have a favorite food and you can smell it cooking in the other room and you're getting ready to eat it and you're sort of imagining what it's gonna be like to eat the food and you're representing it to yourself in all these very like uh, thick ways. You're sort of imagining what it's going to taste like and stuff. So that's a very thick representational state. Uh, He's saying appreciating value is just an abstract or thin representational state. And specifically, it doesn't involve any affect. And so that gets us to the second thing. And so affect is um, it's a common psychological term, and we use it in philosophy a lot. It's not a very common English term, but it's like a, it's like a feeling. Uh, so he could have just said feeling. But uh, we use affect because it's a fancier word. So uh, an affect, it, it sort of like feels like something. It's like... Uh, uh, I don't know, like, it's it's hard to talk about specific affects, but does he give examples? Well, uh, yeah, no, here's one. So pleasure. Pleasure is an affect. So uh, when you represent the meal you're going to be eating, maybe that's pleasurable when you're representing it to yourself. Or uh, the fearsomeness is like an affect. If you're afraid of something, that's an affect. So maybe when you imagine your future, you're afraid, uh, and that would be sort of 
a representational state with an affect, an affect of fear. And he's saying, no, appreciating value, well, he's, I mean, the rationalists are saying, appreciating value, that's an affectless state. It doesn't like feel like anything. When you say, oh, that person is really lovable, it's not like that carries along with it some sort of feeling. It's like, no, it's like an intellectual judgment, basically. So that's, that's a small point, but you do need to understand what this affect talk is to understand this page, so I wanted to explain it. And finally, the biggest point, uh, which is one we've already talked about, but uh, it certainly bears repeating because it comes up in a very big way in this article, is this talk about reasons. So in our first class, so this wasn't in a lecture or on a reading quiz, this was in our first class on love, we talked about the distinction between different ways of using the word reason in English. And I talked about how sometimes we use the word reason as just a synonym for like explanation. And uh, so we might say the reason it's cold outside is that it's uh, the sun has gone down. Or the reason that I'm hungry is that I haven't eaten in two days. Or uh, the reason that uh, humans are bipeds is because we evolved from other bipeds or something. So reasons can just be explanations in this sense. So we that's one use of the English word reason. If you think about this whole unit, like what are we doing in this unit? What are we studying in this unit? We're talking about whether like what whether love has reasons. And if you think back on the readings, we haven't been talking about does love have causes or anything or does sorry so i talked about explanation but also uh this is a reason as a cause so what is the cause for humans being bipeds we evolved from bipeds what is the cause of it being cold outside or something like that so we haven't been talking about does love have any causes does love have any, have any explanations of course love has causes of course love has explanations of course we can explain why somebody fell in love of course we can say here's what caused somebody to fall in love like that's not a puzzle. There's no debate over whether love has reasons in this first sort of sense of the term, what I call the descriptive sense of the term for reasons that'll be clear when we talk about this in a moment. So does love have reasons in this sense? Yes, love has causes, love has explanations. It's not like we have no idea what's going on when somebody falls in love. It's like, what, what happened? How did it, it, no, that's not how it works. Love has reasons in this sense. But that's not really, we're not really talking about that in this unit, because that's just an easy question. There's no debate. What we're talking about is the other sense of the term reasons, the sense in which all the papers we've been reading so far have been using the word reasons. And this is uh, related to sort of rationality, where we say uh, a reason is something that makes things rational. So a uh, reason is something that maybe justifies doing something. So for instance, the, the fact that the sun went down that's not like a reason that makes it rational for it to be cold outside or a reason that justifies it being cold outside. Like being cold outside doesn't need to be rational. or it, It's not something, it's, it's just a natural occurrence. Uh, being bipedal, we don't need reasons for this. We don't need to justify this. It's just how we evolved. Uh, being hungry, I don't need to justify, I don't need to rationalize my hunger. I don't need to justify being hungry. It just happens on its own when I haven't eaten for a while. But we do need to rationalize or justify certain things like the actions we take. So, uh, well, we don't, maybe we don't have to, but if we want to be rational, we have to. So if you want to be rational, you have to act according to reasons in the second sense of the term. You have to, your actions have to be justified by reasons. So for instance, if, I'm, if I say uh, the fact that I'm hungry is a reason to eat a sandwich, that is a rationalizing reason. That would make it rational to eat a sandwich. That would justify eating a sandwich. If you say, Professor Danny, uh, why, how is it rational for you to be eating this sandwich? And I reply, oh, the reason is I'm hungry. That would explain it. So my being hungry is a reason for eating a sandwich. Uh, you're wanting to get a good score on a test is a reason to study for the test. It makes it rational to study for the test. It justifies studying for the test. And so this is a normative sense of the word reasons. You can sort of be rated in terms of your rationality. You can sort of judge somebody, rationally speaking, by whether or not they're being reasonable, by whether or not they're acting according to their reasons, by whether or not they're doing what the reasons tell them to. If I say, look, the, 
the best reasons or the reasons support doing x rather than y and then you do y you're being irrational you're being uh you're not listening to the reasons and so we can judge you like that so that's the kind of reasons we've been talking about so is love the sort of thing that requires justification or rationalization and we've seen people arguing back and forth some people say no love does not get justified by anything love is irrational there are no reasons in the second sense for love and then other people going in the other direction and so that's the topic of this unit and that's the topic of this article too this comes i'm discussing this for two reasons number one it explicitly comes up here on page 10 he sort of talks about the two senses of reasons and number two not only does he talk about the two senses of reasons here he combines them or doesn't he doesn't combine them but like let's we're going to look closely at what he's doing on page 110. so um even if there are rationalists who hold that love can be explained in virtue of being rationalized by reasons well actually this is too far um my focus will instead be on another datum that many rationalists invoke namely that love seems explained in virtue of being rationalized by reasons in particular as jollimore observes we seem to come to love for reasons the attractive and otherwise valuable well blah 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 um so or as herka puts it as well as causes does the beginning of love have justifying reasons i believe there are while this i believe there are while the start of love is partly guided by reasons it's a, well yeah no that's enough so as well as causes does the beginning of love have justifying reasons so herka is asking i agree that it has causes it has causation reasons it has explanatory reasons does it also have justifying reasons and i think so and um so everybody agrees love has causal reasons but and then the rationalists are the people who think it also has rationalizing reasons it also has justifying reasons still even when there are rationalists who hold that love can be explained in virtue of being rationalized by reasons one might one one might wonder why we should think that or one might wonder isn't there supposed to be a difference between reasons that justify things and reasons that explain why something is the case between normative and explanatory reasons but if so why should it matter whether normative reasons can or tend to explain love so here he's setting up look there's this there's different kinds of reasons there's normative reasons and there's explanatory reasons and why are we trying to mush the two together why should it matter whether the normative reasons the things that justify love also explain love also sort of get us to are the reasons that we fall in love are the causes for falling in love so imagine for a moment you think love is justified by reasons you think there are good reasons and bad reasons for love also are these what cause us to fall in love so maybe uh, having good properties is what justifies loving somebody is that also what causes you to fall in love are these also the causal reasons the explanatory reasons and he's thinking well why why should it matter for the rationalists what if they just worry about whether love is justified maybe they don't care whether love is explained by reasons so why should i care whether the justifying reasons are also explanatory reasons they're separate things why should i care he says here's why it matters even if normative reasons are distinct from explanatory reasons there nevertheless tends to be an intimate connection between them especially as noted earlier between fittingness reasons and explanatory ones after all if something seems to us to be true or to be supported by the evidence we tend to come to believe it or to use an example of an emotion suppose that andrew comes to admire candace because she gives generously to charity what explains andrew's coming to admire her is different from what justifies it it's facts like candace's generosity that justify it whereas it's mental states of andrew's like his beliefs about such generosity that explain his admiration but it isn't as if there's no connection between these two sets of reasons some of the explanatory reasons for andrew's coming to admire candace after all are ones that relate him to the normative fittingness reasons for it so we have andrew who admires candace why does he admire her 
causally speaking, what causes him to admire her. It's his beliefs about her. He thinks, oh, Candace gives to charity. And this is the sort of uh, causal reason that he admires her. What justifies it? What makes it rational for him to admire her? It's not his beliefs about her. It's the fact that she actually does give to charity. It's the fact that she's generous. And notice these can come apart because if his beliefs are false, these would cause him to admire her. He would think, oh, she's so nice. She gives to charity, so I admire her. Causally, these would be the reasons he admires her. But they wouldn't justify admiring her because she doesn't actually give to charity. Like, he, he's been misled. Maybe she's, uh, she pretends to give to charity, but she doesn't. So it would be irrational to admire her for giving to charity when she doesn't actually give to charity. So these can come apart. But if he's correct, if his belief is correct, the causal reason he admires her is his beliefs. The justifying reason is why she is, is her giving to charity. But the two are linked. It's not like he just happens to have the belief completely separate from her giving to charity. No, look, it, she gives to charity, and so he comes to believe she gives to charity. So there's a link between the justifying reason, her giving to charity, and the normative reason, the, or sorry, and the explanatory reason, his beliefs, which cause him to think she gives to charity. And he says, look, it's not just that the attitudes that admit of fittingness reasons, so normative reasons, seem explained by or responsive to their rationalizing attitudes. So it's not just that uh, we can explain his belief by pointing to her giving to charity. It's also that they seem characteristically explained in virtue of being rationalized by their rationalizing attitudes, and not in virtue of, for instance, mere associations between contents or a glitch in neural wiring. For instance, it's not just that Andrew will tend to come to admire, er, admire Candace if he thinks she is extremely generous, and, for example, he cares about relieving suffering. It's not that he'll come to admire her if he thinks she's generous. It's also that his belief about Candace's generosity and other relevant mental states will tend to bring about that episode of admiration because they rationalize it. This emotion, in short, will tend to be brought about for fittingness reasons. It's in this way that emotions and beliefy attitudes characteristically differ from irrational states or events like compulsions, tics, or crime. So he says, it's his belief about Candace's generosity, it's, sorry, his belief about Candace's generosity will tend to bring about that episode of admiration because they rationalize it. So why will Andrew admire uh, Candace? Why will Andrew, uh, specifically, why will Andrew's beliefs that Candace is generous cause him to admire her? It's because Candace's generosity uh, rationalizes admiring her. It's not like an accident. And I don't, it's so, this is, it's hard to explain. Like, imagine if it were otherwise. Imagine Candace's generosity did not rationalize Andrew's beliefs. So imagine Andrew's beliefs were caused by some alien brainwashing him to think Candace is generous. Then he'd come to admire her, not because her generosity rationalizes his admiration, but uh, because the aliens have brainwashed him. So that's a weird case. That's not how it usually happens. Usually how it happens is Candace's generosity makes his beliefs rational, and it also makes his admiration rational. This is sort of how it normally works. So there's just this tight link between the cause of Andrew's uh, uh, admiration, which is his beliefs, and the justification for Andrew's rational ex er, admiration, which is his uh, Candace's generosity. So it's not like they're accidentally related. They're very closely related. It's just this is how things normally work. So everything I've just explained is not supposed to be weird or strange. Uh, this is just Han explaining how things normally work. Candace is a generous person. This makes it rational in the justifying sense, to admire her. And this also explains why Andrew comes to have these beliefs which cause him to admire her. That's just how it works. So he thinks there's this link between normative 
and explanatory reasons. And uh, this plays out in love, or it doesn't play out in love. This is the question. There's this debate. And uh, I, well, and then he's going to go through the debate. So you'll see what he thinks. Uh, so that's that and uh, the end. Yeah.